Head sõbrad, meie tänavuse foorumi avab mees, kes leiab, et rohe pööre ei ole maailmale piisavalt hea ja me vajame tegelikult sinist majandust. Ta on pärit väikesest Belgiast, aga on juba jätnud maailmale suure jälje. Ta liitub meie ka virtuaalselt ja räägib inglise keeles. Dear friends, our keynote speaker is a visionary entrepreneur who is steering the world towards blue economy. Gunter Pauli, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and uh, my apologies, uh, we are doing a little test here because I had a very urgent change of agenda. So, at this very moment I am driving in Parma, Italia and we are uh, looking at the chance to really see if uh, astronauts can do it uh, by satellite, why can't we do it uh, from Parma to uh, your wonderful Estonia and in uh, uh, I'm, I'm very glad to this this morning because uh, whatever issue you ever innovation you promote, you are, are going to need it in complete new, new business. I mean, change the world. But if you do not have at the same time a new business model, then it will not work. Let me explain. Today, the business model prescribes that uh, you must be the cheapest, you must cut costs and in order to cut costs and be the cheapest you have only one option that is that you do the best you can to reduce the wages to reduce your cost for taking care of the environment you will outsource and have a supply chain management so that uh, from bangladesh to your uh, brazilian to your indonesian suppliers you are able to really cut down. Now, I'm asking the question, if you're in Tallinn and if you're in Brussels or you're in town, would you ever be able to compete against the Bangladeshis, the Brazilians and the Chinese? It's not you cannot be the cheapest. Therefore, we need to have a business model that allows us to imagine value. So innovation has to be in the first place on generating value instead of to be the cheapest. That to me is the first. The second principle is that we have more that we do local. If you only mean your work by trying to respond to the needs of uh, Japanese and American customers, then you are not taking care of your local needs. And I think this is a very key element. The new business model will not be producing locally so that you are able to uh, serve the world. No, you're producing in order to first and foremost serve your local community. And when you have these principles very clearly before you, then you know that you will have opportunities to fundamentally shift your model of competitiveness because it is not about being environmentalist and then being very green it's also about being capable of continuing to compete so let me give you a very concrete example drinking water well drinking water is a major issue drinking water today is uh, a water that uh, has to be pure Purified, purified from, from waste, uh, purified from plastic waste, uh, it has to be purified uh, all the time. And by being able to have this purification system, uh, actually water is not for free anymore. Water turns into a, uh, an object for water today is already more expensive than petroleum because the input that we have to a reserve to be able to in input in energy and input chemicals and input in membranes these technologies require to invest a lot of money and therefore a lot of operational costs and therefore we have a major challenge that water has become not anymore the common good but has become expensive let's now change the business model desalination filtration and water treatment are existing technologies. Now, let us turn this around 
into a technology that allows us to uh, have what I call multiple benefits for the local population. We have uh, put in place a hydrogen production system that starts from dirty or from salt water. We don't do a desalination, we have no membranes, but we change the physical chemical reaction of the production of the hydrogen. That means that we are producing hydrogen and at the same time we're producing clean water. This is the way nature works. Nature always has multiple benefits, not one benefit, multiple benefits. And if you have the multiple benefit of being able to generate at the same time hydrogen and drinking water, then you have changed the rules of the game. A hydrogen economy that is combined with a clean water economy. That is the innovation in the business model. Of course, traditionally, since we've been working with core business models, we have forgotten that actually everything is working as a system. Nothing is working in isolation. So our capacity to be able to combine the hydrogen plus the water means that we have two revenues. But when you look at the chemical physical reaction of making hydrogen, we actually are able to produce the hydrogen at 350 bar. If you produce hydrogen at 350 bar, at the same time, you have a vacuum, an under pressure, a, a negative pressure. The vacuum and the negative pressure allows you to have about a thousand bar negative pressure. Now, of course, um, from the point of view of the hydrogen and the point of view of the water, that under pressure, that vacuum is of no use. On the other hand, if I'm operating a pyrolysis system because I wanted to remove the nanoplastic particles and the microplastic particles, then I have a lot of plastic polymers available. Then I can destroy those polymers at a lower temperature thanks to the application of the vacuum of a thousand bar. You see, what we need in, in our business models is we need to be able to see the multiple benefits and turn that into an integrated system. You cannot operate that at the level of a nation, but you can operate that at the level of a town. Uh, you can do that at the level of an island. Take Hikuma Island, uh, which has uh, uh, the largest uh, bioplastics transformation plant in the uh, whole of Scandinavia. Uh, when this uh, plant is operated uh, with uh, salt water, producing drinking water and producing hydrogen, all of a sudden the island gets into a complete new economic model because we're talking about hydrogen, bioplastics, eliminating all plastics, uh, generating with pyrolysis more hydrogen. Because if you can operate pyrolysis through a hydrogen process, uh, then you are generating at low cost your hydrogen. So I can continue sharing with you how we weave those innovations together. And our business model, as a result, responds to local needs. But it is not like we're just offering food or we're just offering water. We're actually introducing the local community to the next hydrogen economy with a zero kilometer distribution table, meaning that we are able to supply the hydrogen to the local community. And this means we need innovations to use hydrogen batteries on the use of hydrogen in the local economy, which will turn me independent petroleum and will dramatically increase our capacity to be serving not only the local community, but we're serving the environment. You see, when we are proceeding on this logic, then we have a never-ending cycle of innovations. Innovations that will not change the world, but it will change the livelihoods and the viability and the joy of the communities locally. And that means that we will have strong local communities. Very many people forget that the macro economy is a
amalgamation of local economies. So if we want to change the world, we have to start by changing local economies. And this is a very different approach. We need to have a different strategy for Hikama Island. You can not have exactly the innovation is also the same. Fundamentally changing the way we look at it. And since we are able to implement this and deliver not only proof of concept, we are delivering proof of operations. This is a big shift. If you have a proof of operations, then you are changing the way that countries communicate this uh, technological opportunities. We have all these technologies on our uh, experimental vessel. We well, it's a challenge, isn't it, that in 2021, we're not able to have uh, a conversation um, with a riding car. Uh, it just shows how, how poorly developed our internet uh, technologies are. And perhaps um, after our introductory talk about uh, hydrogen and water and uh, pyrolysis and uh, how we can integrate those different technologies, uh, perhaps it is also the right moment to talk about the novel way of thinking about the internet. You know, the internet originally was designed to be an internet that allows us to have a democratic access to information. Unfortunately, the internet today has transformed itself in the next petroleum, meaning that uh, the data that is being transmitted over the internet is also becoming an object of economics. Object of economics means that you buy and sell, and in order to buy and sell, you need to control the market. The market today is reserved to about 10 companies that can capture all metadata that is available. This is what we have labeled in business data mining. And it is really mining because someone appropriates uh, herself or himself with all the data that is available. And at the same time, the ones who are supplying the data are not being remunerated except for some small compensations uh, like uh, um, a free internet account, uh, a free translation, um, a search engine. And, and we have been looking at uh, the reality and we said, if we have a business model that we call the blue economy, what would be the business model for the internet that is totally different? And, and instead of uh, calling this uh, data mining, do we have the opportunity to engage in what is called data farming? Can we have local systems that permit us to jointly create the data that we have in our community and then make it available to our community? It is interesting that we just did a research in France and we verified that uh, the questions the French ask Google to answer well, 99.8% of the questions asked to Google to respond to, which are, of course, in the world, 99.8% of the questions are responded to by Google are found in France. So it's quite an amazing situation that 99.8% of the questions are responded to by France, but we have set up a system where all the questions, where the questions come from, and even those who provide the answers are in France. So why doesn't France have an internet for 99.8% of the questions in France? We have decided to work on that. We have decided to set up an economic model that allows us to capture the question and the answer locally. Just like I said in the beginning, 
the new economy is an economy that first and foremost responds to the local needs with what is locally available applied to data and it is not very difficult to do we know that from a technical point of view but we have quickly realized that the first thing you need to resolve is your local access to the internet if your local access is a fiber optic cable and then you're immediately connected to this mesh of servers around the world which are by the way one of the main reasons for an excessive consumption of energy the growth of energy by servers around the world is one of the main causes of our greenhouse gas increases so what do we have to do we we know that most of our laptop computers already can uh, operate like a local server and, and many people are doing exactly that. We know that local communities have a lot of questions about local communities in their local language. So the connectivity that we have opted for is uh, therefore in need of using the best possible penetration in each house. So it is not about setting up antennas, new antennas for 4G, 5G, 6G, whatever we have, the Bluetooth. It is a connectivity that is already there. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the big shift. We are shifting from a technology whereby we are able to operate a internet using the most widely available structure, infrastructure, and that is light. So the internet of the future, the local internet, the data farming of internet, is going to be based on a widely available infrastructure. And that widely available infrastructure is light. The light penetrates every room unless uh, you are living somewhere in a tree house in the forest. But otherwise, all light infrastructure is fully available in every single corner of a house, even in your cellar. As a result, we have designed now a new internet uh, facility that allows us to secure local connectivity through light. Now, if you have local connectivity through light, you do not need a TCP IP. You know what a TCP IP is. TCP IP is, is a unique address given to you by an organization called ICANN in the United States and they can on their own decide if you're connected or not connected. They can decide to shut down uh, your whole installation if they don't like you, if they have an instruction from a government uh, that is powerful enough to impress on them to follow their requirements. So what we look at is a light connectivity based on an internet connectivity that is without a TCP IP. Now, if you don't have a TCP IP, you need to validate who is your local supplier of the data, who is your local point of connectivity. And that is, of course, done with another technology which everyone talks about, blockchain. So we can go back to the internet under the concept of data farming and having local responses to local people in local languages only by using a network the concept of the ip and network connectivity through servers the first thing that happens is a dramatic reduction in energy consumption dramatic second what happens is that we have a major distribution of local server capacity simply by having laptops uh, that are so powerful today that with some minor adaptations you can and these adaptations are purely software and you in Tallinn you in Estonia you know how to make those kind of softwares you have proven that in the past so I'm saying to you basically the first element was the hydrogen economy from seawater and the second element is data farming through light. And if we take just these two examples, um, you know that we have operated with our scientists, 3,000 scientists from around the world. We have operated today numerous of these initiatives 
the hydrogen we have delivered the proof of concept and we have now delivered the proof of operations around the hydrogen now time has come to deliver the proof of operation of the data farming i have written a 25 page paper on this and carefully summarized how some of these steps can be taken and we are taking them in france in french of course um, but at the same time to conclude let me take one step back take one step back because where does my inspiration come from my inspiration in the first place comes of course from these incredible scientists that have been contributing for the past decades to the development of these very innovative game changing concepts and have permitted legacy investors to implement this but my inspiration in the end comes from nature life around me you know the internet of the future is the internet that has been implemented already effectively today by the mycorrhizal fungi the fungi today operate the most dense internet ever seen and ever imagined a mycorrhizal fungi connects a whole forest through their hyphae through their very thin cables wires and just in one cubic centimeter there is a kilometer of wiring available imagine a kilometer of wiring the density of data capture which allows a very efficient data distribution has been implemented in the forest now more than about half of your country's forests you have the inspiration of the mycorrhizal fungi and the interconnectivity right there in your country so my suggestion is go for a good hike over the weekend it's springtime go and have a look not at the flowers and the bees and the beautiful green leaves but take the time to look below your feet and when you look below your feet you'll be inspired for years to come to help design this transformation the economy we all need thank you thank you very much Gunter. that was intriguing uh I'm just wondering, perhaps just one question before we wrap up this conversation. Uh, is there a way or is there a need to uh, turn back urbanization? Because as we look at the trends in Estonia, I mean, most of the people in the country will soon live in Tallinn. Tallinn is becoming a kind of a city state. Uh, and I guess this is the global trend, but it's very, very noticeable in Estonia. Should we reverse that somehow and perhaps turn the rest of Estonia as a nature reserve? Um, I, I don't like nature reserves. I mean, I don't like to be put in a zoo myself, uh, so let's not put others in a zoo either. My suggestion is that we need to have a re-ruralization. China has opted for that. And we have demonstrated with the island of El Hierro that if there is enough generation of economic value, value added into the local communities, and this is exactly the value is generated by what? First of all, by your energy uh, that you have available locally. And second, it is available thanks to your data exchanges. So if we can turn light bulb in every barn on a farm into an internet hub, well, then you will have people stay. And on top of that, the light will give me a connectivity that is 10 to 20 times faster today than 5G. And if I have the hydrogen produced locally, either from salt water or from dirty water or highly mineral water underground, then I will substitute the petroleum and that cash for petroleum or natural gas in the case of Estonia will be able to drive your economy locally forward. Well, Gunter, imagine if we had all that and you were here in Estonia driving through our forests without any hiccups in your uh, internet connection. Thank you so much for opening the conference and good luck uh, in changing the world bit by bit. Thank you for your patience with me and this connectivity. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.